Let's look back through the digital mists of time. Back to the early 80s, when the computer and video game industry was booming in Europe, and every game publisher and developer were looking for ways to make their games visually more attractive. It didn't take long before everyone started experimenting with 3D graphics. 3D games back then was quite different compared to the fancy GPU-accelerated games of today. Shaded 3D polygons were just a glimmer in the programmer's eyes back then, due to the fact that the home machines at the time weren't really powerful enough. But of course that didn't stop everyone from slapping the word 3D onto all kinds of games, with varying degrees of success. The first home computer game that used 3D was 3D Monster Maze for the ZX81, released in 1981. The ZX81 was a very humble home computer that lacked both sound, color and proper high-resolution graphics. Yet the game used 3D to great effect and is still fondly remembered today, and considered one of the best ZX81 games. Then in the arcades in January 1982, a game called Saxon appeared, that introduced a new type of pseudo-3D effect, an axonometric projection type called isometric projection. But let's not get too technical. I still remember seeing this game for the first time in the arcade, and the visuals blew my mind into orbit. It didn't take long before this isometric technique started appearing on home computers. A game called 3D Ant Attack for the ZX Spectrum, later converted to the Commodore 64 in Amstrad, was released in August 1983. It used shaded isometric graphics, and is considered to be one of the first, if not the first, isometric game for home computers. It was very well received, much thanks to its visuals, and has since become a classic. The year after, in 1984, another classic isometric computer game was released, Night Law by Ultimate Play the Game. It was very well received by the press and gamers alike, very much thanks to its amazing visual. After that, the isometric craze really got going and everyone seemed to try their hands at it, with varying results. And the year after that, in late 1985, another classic isometric game was released on the ZX Spectrum, called Fairlight, published by The Edge and coded by Swedish programmer Bo Jangebori, who I had the pleasure of interviewing in July 2016. A little about myself. Well, I um, I found uh, computers uh, in a sense in the 70s. Um, uh, at our school, we had a little machine called the ABC80, which was a Swedish uh, machine, which um, happened to have a uh, a little processor in it called the Z80, and um, that one was also the basis for a, uh, a machine that uh, turned up uh, a couple of years later called the uh, ZX Spectrum, which turned out to be my, my beginning career in, uh, in programming. And, um, well, that, that's, that's sort of where I started out, uh, started out programming. I was at that point, uh, I think when, when I started, uh, when I saw this first computer sort of, uh, and had a, a bit of interaction with it, that I was about 18 years old or something like that. Uh, I had seen computers before then. I even seen computer games. I saw a game called uh, the classic old pong game, the, the this, uh, Atari ping pong game, uh, which everybody knows by now, I suppose. And um, that was a couple of years uh, earlier, in 75 maybe or something like that. I can't remember. That, that was the first game I ever played. Yeah, a computer game, I should say. Uh, later on, I also played sort of all the different types of game defenders and, uh, and uh, space invaders and, uh, and those old classics. So that, that was... Um, I, I realized at an early point that, hmm, computer games, that's fun. <laughs> I want to do something like that. Well, I think I found most of the places in, in Gothenburg that, uh, that had these machines. I got into... Um, uh, lots of different types of gaming, uh, gaming situations. For instance, I, at an early stage, I, I sort of liked things like chess. We played a lot of Monopoly and all these kind of standard board games. And in uh, could have been in '78, I think I discovered uh, Dungeons and Dragons, so uh, role playing. Uh, 
I even had a little, published a little fanzine with uh, role playing tips and uh, information about uh, role playing games and uh, things like that. So we published that for six issues or something like that. Uh, that was uh, called Mjölnir, after Thor's hammer. So that was, uh, oh, that was quite a fun little uh, period. A friend of mine who, who was the one who actually initiated the whole project, he, he actually um, uh, just recently uh, uh, restarted the, uh, that little thing. So he, uh, he now, 30 years later, he came out with uh, issue number seven. <laughs> and, and, and to a large degree, I mean, board games and games in general uh, in, interconnect a lot with, uh, with the computer, uh, and computer games and the computer world. And a lot, I think a lot of um, games you can trace the roots of it back to, uh, to board games, actually. And I was active in the, in the board game uh, club in, here in Gothenburg too, or several actually, and, uh, and also in role-playing game, games and uh, things like that. So I, I was more into uh, hanging out with uh, some guys who started a, a, a shop here in Gothenburg called Wizard. It was actually the first, uh, first commercial uh, science fiction and fantasy uh, boutique in, in Sweden. So they were selling books and posters and uh, games and uh, miniature figures and stuff like that. So that was, uh, that was pretty cool. The first little game I did, I suppose, that was this uh, uh, this uh, little shoot 'em up game, which was a really, really simple little game. A little, you had a little spaceship that was shooting down things uh, that was coming down from on the screen, uh, and it was it was it was dead simple, and it it was um, it came as part of a uh, a compilation of little mini, mini games that was uh, on a um, on a tape magazine, as they called it. It was a, basically a Cardboard with uh, a bit of uh, bit of information on it as a as a magazine, but uh, mainly it was this tape with uh, with games that you could uh, uh, load in from your cassette player, taking several minutes at that time. The the artist is uh, is really where I started my programming, because basically I, I realized that computers was fun. I wanted a computer, I got myself a ZX Spectrum, and uh, right, okay, what am I going to do now? So the first thing I started doing was to try to, to control uh, the, uh, the graphical output. So I put something on the screen, and okay, I'll make a little dot and move that dot about. And um, that was fine, but I realized that was very slow. So at that point, uh, a friend of mine had, uh, had the uh, the instruction booklet for the Z80 uh, machine code. I borrowed that from him and with that I was able to, starting to peek and poke, as, the, as it was called at that point, uh, and poke in uh, into memory locations uh, machine code that I could then execute. And the speed difference between doing, uh, using the standard uh, basic that came with, uh, with the Spectrum and doing the machine code was it was extreme. So I sort of realized that, okay, machine code, that's the thing. And uh, I started building up uh, routines from then on. Uh, sort of, first thing was a little dot, uh, as I said before, uh, but now in machine code. And uh, moving that dot about, uh, okay, right, that's fun. Okay, I want to leave a trace, so it turned into a trace. Um, okay, maybe I should do something programmatically. So, okay, I wanted to draw a line instead. So, I, I programmed my little dot to uh, programmatically draw a line. And from then on, it, it started to grow. So, I, I got myself a library of routines. Uh, drawing a line, drawing a circle, drawing, uh, making a routine that could fill in a, 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 an area. So, for instance, I make a circle and then I tell my little routine to, okay, fill in that area with a sort of a, uh, black, just black ink, sort of. 
And after a while I realized that, hmm, okay, you could probably, because I'd seen the Macintosh and you, you saw all the different uh, things you could do with that one, okay, you can do, oh yeah, you can fill in with a pattern, that's, that's quite neat. So, uh, okay, how would I do that? And then I figured out how to do that, so I can then fill in an, uh, an, an area with, uh, with a pattern. So you could have a chest pattern or a little things that I later on used for, for my games. It was uh, things like a, a wall pattern or a floor pattern or, a, well, things like that. All of these routines I then packaged together into uh, to what turned out to be the, uh, then the, uh, the artist, uh, this uh, little art package. And um, it had most of the features that you, that you found in the, uh, on the, uh, the Mac Paint, sort of. So I was inspired by that, you could say. I still had this uh, sort of separate engine, which I called Crax uh, later on which actually was a little miniature programming language in itself that I could use to uh, control uh, a set of, uh, of instructions. So, so I could say, for instance, okay, draw from this point to this point, then make a circle, then draw another line, then do this, do this, this, to construct uh, an image. And this was used by some, uh, some friends of mine to, uh, to illustrate uh, uh, some small graphical adventures. So these sort of uh, like go east, go west, uh, you type in sort of thing and whenever you go to a new location, it, it draw, uh, draw a little, uh, a little landscape or a tree or a pyramid or whatever sort of. That was probably the first uh, commercial use of this, uh, of this uh, graphics package or graphics language that, that I had. Yeah, I, I, after that I used it for, for, the, for my commercial games, the, the Fairlight, uh, Fairlight 1 and Fairlight 2, but before that uh, there was a, a ga game called uh, Gizeh. Uh, it was not, not that well known, it had, it had some quite pretty graphics to it and it was quite, a, quite an interesting little game. You, you were wandering around exploring the, uh, the pyramids. And um, that was made by uh, one of the guys at uh, this gaming store that I talked about before, Wizard. There's another guy, uh, another old friend of mine, who, who used it to, uh, to make, uh, I think he made several games that was published in this, uh, um, this uh, cassette tape uh, magazine that I mentioned. Was the development of Fairlight done on an actual spectrum and how did you fit everything in there? The uh, the development, yeah, it was done entirely on a, on a static spectrum. Yes, yeah, a lot of people wonder that, but the I think the, the main trick was this uh, graphical language that I talked about before, uh, Grax. It was extremely uh, optimized. So, I mean, I I even I could have. I mean, if, if you know anything about computers, you know that that uh, one of the basic uh, cornerstones is um, uh, something called a byte which is basically a, a number between 0 and 256, or 255 to be, to be correct. Um, and uh, I actually, for, for my graphical language, I realized that, oh, well, I don't need that high a number. So quite often I split that byte into two. So I had sort of a, a half a byte, which stored the, uh, the, uh, the, the programming code. Thereby I could have sort of quite often double the amount of information in, uh, for, for doing the, um, uh, well, describing the, the, um, the effects I wanted to do. And um, so that, that became ex extremely, uh, extremely um, what you, uh, compressed, the, uh, the entire information. I, I could, in a few bytes, I, I could describe the entire back of a, uh, the, or one of the uh, specific rooms all I needed to do, okay, draw a line there, draw a line there, make a little circle there. Uh, let's see, we'll add in a couple of standard components, uh, which was of course pre-made graphics, uh, which uh, I then copied in in certain locations. Uh, and then I had these fill patterns that I mentioned before, which uh, created uh, the texture of, of um, ground, walls, whatever. and. Um, that by itself meant that to describe one room, I needed very, very little memory. The main amount of memory that was used was for this fixed graphics. So for instance, character animations, uh, 
different uh, well, uh, fixed uh, objects and things like that, which uh, was too too complex to describe with the uh, with this little uh, this little language. The, the, the drawback with having these kind of uh, this language actually drawing up the picture was that even though I made the, uh, the graphical routines very very fast, uh, it still took a little time to uh, to draw it. So if you played the game, you, you you might remember that it sort of blacked out when you went from one area to the next one. It took a, a second or two maybe before you came into the uh, the next room. That time I used to uh, to render the uh, the next uh, backdrop. So that's uh, that's how that worked. Were there any bugs in the released version of Fairlight One? Fairlight One, I don't I don't think we actually did a bug fix. There, there was a, a panic thing that we had to do because we had to redo some of the uh, initial uh, 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 tapes that we did because uh, there was a bug in in the very very first thing uh, we did because I had. At a very, very late stage, we put in a uh, code for a, a Kempston joystick, a little extra dongle that you added to the computer. And uh, that one had the uh, X and Y uh, axis flipped. So <laughs> that simple little mistake uh, meant that, uh, that uh, they remastered a, a fair number of tapes. But I don't think any of that actually went out into, uh, into sales. So a, a lot of the job was in, uh, in doing this graphical engine, as uh, I've been talking about Cracks, who was sort of the heart of uh, a lot of it. And um, that one I developed during the course of a, a year, year and a half maybe, or something like that. Um, so I mean, when I first um, came to the publisher, uh, it wasn't to, to sell in a game, it was to sell in the artist, the, uh, the, the graphical package. Um, that encounter led on to, to doing Fairlight. So the, the actual development of Fairlight in itself took about uh, seven months. I know because I had to uh, apply for an extension to stay in, in Britain because you, you could, at that point you could only stay for six months uh, on the, uh, the tourist visa uh, because I was there. Um, I was self-employed, so I was, I, I was never, never breaking any rules uh, as such, so I wasn't there. I was there working in a sense, but since I was working for myself, that, that wasn't the problem. Um, but so I was there for six months, and then had to stay for another month to, uh, to actually finish the the, uh, the stuff. And uh, so yeah, seven months plus, say one and a half year for, for making the uh, a lot of the the, um, the tools that I used to to make the game later on. Well, the, I, had, I had my own little sprite routine. So what, what happened was that they had seen Ultima play the game, premiering one of the, their, uh, or the, the first 3D, uh, sort of this fake 3D uh, title. It's called an asymmetric view of the, uh, the game. And um, basically it's, it, it's, a, it's a way of cheating. All the, all the sprites are, are the same size. Normally in modern day 3D games, as something gets further away, that graphics get smaller, and as it, get, uh, as it gets closer, it, it gets bigger, of course. That would be normal with uh, three division. But in these isometric games, what we were doing was that we were cheating. You can think of it as we were putting a camera up in the upper, upper corner of a room. From there, you have a reasonably equal distance to a large part of the room. And that means that you actually you can sort of cheat your way by having the same size of graphics wherever you are in the in the room. So what I had was a, a little sprite routine which allowed me to move graphics about, and I added uh, added a layer of uh, of, uh, of real 3D calculations in the background, so I knew sort of what objects was in front of uh, of the other object, and. Uh, and thereby you could sort of, if I moved one object, and I know that, okay, now I need to render this one before the other one, and thereby you, you create this illusion of, uh, of uh, three dimensions. In fact, everything was actually just flat on top of each other, but the, uh, the, um, the optical illusion that it creates actually tricks the brain. 
The very first game that I saw this in was a game called uh, Saxon. It came out in the arcades in the, uh, what can it be, around 1980 maybe or something like that. Wow, you can do 3D, sort of. And then you, after a while you realize that, well, maybe not quite, but it's good enough, <laughs> sort of. What happened uh, when I came then to uh, to this publisher that was about to publish the um, the Scarfield package? I, I've been in contact with them before, and been been over to England and uh, just to get uh, in contact with the publisher. And then I came back uh, a few months later uh, to deliver the, the final copy. And uh, it was at that point that I saw them trying to implement something that looked like uh, what uh, Ultimate Play the game had done and uh, they couldn't quite get the hang of it. But I knew how to do it. I had figured out sort of uh, an idea of what, what to do. So I went home and uh, home to the hotel room and overnight knocked together a little demo which basically showed sort of uh, the, the technique of how to do it without having massive amounts of flicker and, uh, and so on. And they sort of, wow. And <laughs> And um, from then on, I, I, I was actually supposed to stay in England for a week, uh, but ended up staying for seven months instead, so, and, uh, and did the game. I think the, there was one guy who he managed to go around picking up all the guards, putting them in the same room, it's sort of the game sort of more or less stopped, I would have, would have assumed, because uh, it wasn't done on a, on a sort of fixed frame rate, but it was, uh, it was going full speed uh, to do the uh, the normal uh, normal rendering, which meant also that on a screen where uh, where there was more than Isfar, the, the hero walking around, you could see that he's actually slowing uh, slower uh, on those screens. So if you had more than two or three uh, monsters walking around to, together with him, things really started to slow down. Were you involved with porting the game to any other systems? No, I only worked on the uh, on the Spectrum. The um, there was uh, one guy doing a conversion to the Amstrad, but I think he could use my code more or less uh, as it was because the Amstrad was also based on the ZX80. The, the guy who did the uh, Commodore translation uh, had a bit more work to do because uh, that was a completely different um, process. So he had to rewrite everything from scratch. And I know he had a bit of a problem because uh, the Commodore suffered from another problem. It was, uh, admittedly, in, much, uh, in, in many senses, it was a better computer. It had uh, sprites and better sound and, and so on. But the main processor was slower than the ZX Spectrum. So the time it took to, to, for instance, render a backdrop in this compressed way that I did uh, was taking longer on the uh, Commodore and uh, a lot of different things was uh, more difficult to do on the uh, Commodore 64 than the way I did it. I, I don't remember whether he ended up doing um, some work with the, uh, with the sprites system in, in the Commodore 64, but I, I don't think he did actually, so uh, kudos to him for, for actually making a good job in translating that. Here's a look at the beautiful loading screen for the game. An interesting detail here is that you can actually see the starting area of the game to the right by that small tower. And the view on the loading screen is actually from the wizard's tower, where you need to go to finish the game. Who made the loading screen? That, that was done by, um, by the, uh, the graphical artist that uh, helped me with the game, a, game, a guy called uh, Jack Wilkes. So he did, he did that loading screen and he did a lot of the, uh, all the graphics in the game. Uh, the prettiest bits, that, bits I would say. <laughs> I'm not, I, I mean, I was in a cave. I was okay for doing graphics, but, uh, but he, was, uh, he really had the, uh, the touch. Uh, for making these little, uh, I especially love his little guards. That sort of uh, the guards that sort of grew out of, of the helmet, and uh, really, really uh, fun little uh, animations. And he also had some um, meat-eating plants that sort of uh, came after you. That was uh, they were really they were really nicely done. So I did all the uh, all the backgrounds uh, basically. So that I draw uh, drew in uh, in um, racks. I also did the, uh, the, the main character, uh, Isvar, the, the hero, uh, walking around with this little sword. Uh, and uh, I, I did bits and pieces here and there. But um, I think the most impressive bits I, I would say Jack did. So. Former plumber Jack Wilkes started working at the Edge as early as 1983, when the company was called Softec International. 
Theory, among other things, worked on ZX Spectrum loading screens and in-game graphics. On the 16-bit systems he created visuals for such games as Snoopy, the cool computer game, and Garfield, Big Fat Harry Deal. In the early 90s he started working with the developer Divide by Zero, where he worked with animation on such games as Innocent Until Caught, The Orion Conspiracy and Guilty. In the mid-90s he seems to have dropped off the radar completely and uh, most likely left the gaming industry, and I have been unable to find out what he has been up to since. There is a little, uh, little Fairlight tune, which, uh, which became quite, quite well known because it was really, really nicely done. Uh, because they managed to, to squeak out um, two separate tunes. Sort of, in, the Spectrum didn't really had any sound processing. What it had was dead simple. You could turn the, uh, you could turn the, the little speaker on and off, and by turning it on and off quickly enough, you actually generate a sound wave. So that's how sound was made on the Spectrum. It was it was really really uh, really 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 basic, and uh, these guys they managed to figure out a, a way to get uh, more than one one uh, tune out of it. They had their own engine. Uh, so they, they, were, they were sort of selling a little package uh, with the uh, with the little sound engine and the uh, and the music. Uh, but I don't I don't remember what it was called at that point. So. Tell us about the other creative talents involved with the game. Well, there was uh, the uh, the boss of the uh, the company, Softech. He was called at that point, uh, Tim Langdon. He he did a, uh, did write the uh, the story that came with the booklet. He wasn't actually involved in the uh, in the game, making of the game as such, but he, he did make the little text for the booklet. And uh, I think he came up with the uh, name for the hero, Isvar. <laughs> Uh, and so on, and you can also see him actually. He's, if if you see the poster for the uh, for the game, that's also the box cover. You can see uh, the hero and the uh, and the, the wizard in the back. The guy who did the um, did this painting uh, actually used me <laughs> as the <laughs> as the uh, the image for uh, for the hero and uh, Tim. Uh, for the uh, for the wizard, so we're actually both in the, in the picture on that one. The artist who created the amazing cover artwork is painter and airbrush artist Stuart Sam Hughes. In the early 80s, he created cover art for many different games, but also covers for computer books. And he also made the cover art for the artist, which was also published by Softec, aka The Edge. In the mid-90s he was commissioned by developer Divide by Zero to airbrush the backgrounds for their adventure games Innocent Until Caught and Guilty. His artwork was then digitized and used as location graphics. Here you can see some of the original artwork kindly provided by Stuart. Stuart Hughes is still active today, creating paintings, murals, motorcycle art and more. Tell us about the awards that Fairlight won. The awards? Well, I mean, the awards at that time was mainly uh, issued by um, two of the big uh, Spectrum magazines. So there was one called uh, Crash and uh, another one called uh, Your Sinclair. I think, well, I think mainly it was Crash who had uh, some kind of competition or some, some kind of uh, prize. And I think it, it did win. Fairlight won four of a total of 14 awards in the Crash Readers Awards in 1985. And as the name suggests, the votes of the readers of the magazine decided the winners. Fairlight won Best Arcade Adventure, Best Graphics, Best Music, and the State of the Art Award. Boo also got a commendation in Computer and Video Games Golden Joystick Awards. The game also sold well in the UK and reached first place in the charts at the end of 1985. No, I wasn't even there for the uh, for the prize ceremony, sort of, because I was back in Sweden, and the, the cost of going back and forth to, to England was. But they did, they did have trade fairs and things like that. So I mean, they, I, I was over to one of the trade fairs and uh, signing autographs and uh, things like that. So, so I mean, it, yeah, it did make it did have a certain amount of impact. So, so at least in England, I, I would I didn't 
I didn't get that much uh, sort of uh, appreciation of it from back here in Sweden. So uh, in, in England, I was actually even uh, interviewed by uh, I think uh, one of the bigger bigger morning papers, at least uh, if, if it was the, uh, the could have been the Guardian, or could have been. Uh, Oh, I don't remember one of them. So they actually interviewed me and uh, and uh, made a made a review of the of the game. Sort of, so that was quite fun. The the uh, your Sinclair uh, review was absolutely amazing because I mean what they did because they 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 got completely transfixed by the game, so they they played through uh, all of it and uh, did a, a big layout. With all the uh, all the different locations in a very nicely made little uh, map, uh, which they'd sort of uh, patched together, uh, really nicely done. They even sort of spilled coffee on it to make it to, to make it stained to to look old and things like that. And it, it, it looked it looked amazing. It was really really good. In hindsight, did you feel that the game was too hard, and did you ever finish it yourself? By by modern standards, definitely <laughs> yes. I mean, I couldn't finish it myself actually. So I mean, so I mean, uh, yeah. Obviously, it was too hard in a sense. But I think it only took two weeks or something like that after we released it, and someone actually uh, claimed to have uh, to, uh, completed it all. It was possible to finish, but uh, there wasn't that many people who did it. I think uh, it was really hard. I mean, in those days, you didn't. You didn't make games in the same way you do today, where you have sort of easy, hard, or all that. You made a game, and then people got as far as they could. Sort of, <laughs> you needed to make them hard because, uh, let's face it, there wasn't that much con content in, in, in most of these games. If you, if the game wasn't good enough to be uh, to be repeated then uh, you didn't have enough game in there, uh, in a sense. Today you can have uh, long elaborate storylines with uh, ex extremely nice graphics and uh, voice actors who do lots of stuff and so on. The actual gameplay that it turns out uh, to be is maybe a, a few hours uh, in, in some of these games, but the amount of effort they put into doing that is, uh, is enormous. Then again, I mean, even today you have games like well, Civilization, for instance, or other types of games where, where you have more or less endless uh, repetitive uh, ability, so you can replay it and replay it and replay it in every game. It's, it's slightly different, and you can make different choices, and, and everything everything can go on for a, for a long time. And I think that was the that was the case for nearly all the games in uh, in the early days. That they were made to be played for a, uh, for a long time. If you had elaborate fixed storylines that you were supposed to go through, then uh, there wasn't enough uh, the, uh, enough memory, uh, enough uh, budget, basically, to, to make games that that could last uh, last that long. That that you required of a game uh, in those days. It's not obvious sort of what you're supposed to do or where you're supposed to go, which, which is part of the charm and also is sort of a, a problem with these kind of games that it, uh, it, uh, the lack of focus for some players means that they, they can get bored with it because, uh, oh, I don't know what to do and then play something else. But uh, for those people who really like to explore and sort of go and find out, oh, how do I get there and so on, the exploring part is, uh, is, is quite strong in that uh, genre. Who owns the rights to the game? Is it still the Edge? I presume so. Uh, we had a bit of a legal wrangling at the end uh, and, uh, and the, the final uh, the final uh, chord that we came to, they they signed. Uh, I signed over the uh, the rights to uh, to the game uh, to them for to get some money out of the uh, the final Fairlight 2 uh, product. And uh, so, as far as I know, it's still the Edge who, who sits on the rights uh, to it. There was uh, some Polish company that, that approached me. This is maybe ten years ago or something like that. It was. I was uh, starting to think about doing uh, doing these 
these retro stuff and, and updating it to, uh, to run on, on mobile phones and stuff like that. Uh, but I told them I didn't have the rights and sent them on to the edge and I didn't hear anything more about it uh, at that point. And uh, I know there were some, some uh, fans who was doing modern, modernized versions of uh, Fairlight. There was one guy who put a fair amount of job into it, and, uh, but I think that was uh, shut down by, uh, by the edge who didn't, uh, well, they wanted to be, be paid for someone, somebody doing a, a copy of it, uh, basically. It was, it was never intended to be uh, commercial as far as I know that this guy did. But, uh... Was there ever any plans to convert the game to the 16-bit systems at the time, like the Atari ST, Amiga or any of the consoles? Uh, no, not as far as I know. Uh, because, I mean, this was, I think the, the first Amigas and Ataris came out, uh, the, the sort of bigger machines uh, came out around 85 or something like that. And um, as far as I know, that was uh, that, that was never on the cards. They, it could have been that they, uh, the Edge was uh, thinking about it, but uh, I, I never saw anything about it anyway. How did you come up with the name Fairlight? Oh, well, we were just uh, brainstorming, uh, sort of uh, something that sounds sounds good, and that came up. After a while, we realized that well, okay, there's a synthesizer called the same, but oh well, let's go. It's it's not the same same thing sort of it's uh, never heard anything from them so thank you for, for not for not uh, <laughs> not suing us for that one at least uh, well i too well um what to say um i started doing it uh, well quite soon after the first fairlight was done and at that point uh, i wanted to work with the uh, work mainly here back in gothenburg and to do that, uh, I need a graphic artist that was uh, based here in Gothenburg. So that's why I approached uh, Nicholas to do the, uh, the graphics. So we worked on that for uh, well, eight months or something like that. And then after that, I took, uh, uh, took a few months uh, going over to England to, to finish, to sort of get into sort of crunch time. To, uh, to finish the game and uh, Nicholas were there too uh, for a short period. We even uh, shared, a, shared a hotel room for a while which g gave rise to some, some people in the office who suddenly fig uh, figured that oh he must be gay or something which because sort of two guys splitting a room in, in, in England was apparently not, uh, not that common in those days so I don't know. Uh, so that was a bit silly anyway. Niklas, uh, Niklas Estelin uh, was the, uh, the guy who did the, uh, the graphics for uh, Fairlight 2. Lots of nice little trees and uh, he had a wolf walking about. Uh, and, uh, so he did the animations and, and, the, uh, and the, uh, well, all the different types of sort of sprite graphics, you could say. Um, he's an old-time old fr friend, friend of mine who uh, been working with graphics for, well, He's still still working, uh, I think, in the uh, advertising business and do uh, do drawings and stuff like that for for different companies and so on. He's a very 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 talented guy. So Niklas Östelin also made the amazing loading screen for the ZX Spectrum version of Fairlight 2. Beyond Fairlight 1 and 2, Niklas seems to only have worked on one other game so far, and that is Younger Boys: Rise and Fall, which he created the in-game graphics for in the early 2000s. Today, Nicholas is working as a freelancing graphics designer and illustrator. She, she gave a bit of credit to um, to the woman who, who did the uh, uh, the cover art for the uh, for the box there too. She, uh, I mean, you, you see this little uh, little cover art for the, for the box, and it's not bigger bigger than that. And you figure that okay, that's some big poster that, that they've done, and then just shrunk it down, sort of. No. Everything was done in watercolor and was about that size, I think. It was absolutely amazing what she managed to, to cram into that little picture, so that was, uh, that was quite nice. The amazing watercolor illustration was created by Susan Rowe, and it was a commission from The Edge, but not sure if it was specifically for Fairlight 2, though. In the early 80s, Susan's beautifully detailed fantasy artwork was used in many different game covers and ads, by publishers such as Quicksilver, The Edge, Origin Systems and others. Susan is still active today, working as an artist and illustrator. 
There were some pretty nasty bugs in the released version of Fairlight 2. Were they ever officially fixed? The, the, I think there was a, a release. I mean, what happened was at the end of, of Fairlight 2, I never actually completed the game. Um, because I got into this legal wrangling that I mentioned um, before with them. They basically they, they were withholding royalties for, for Fairlight in trying to force me to sign a contract, uh, a more long-term contract with them. And I wasn't interested in doing that because, well, there, there were problems with the company, I thought. And um, so they were withholding it. And at that point I was withholding uh, code, code so that they uh, shouldn't be able to, to publish it. But they had uh, some of the, uh, one of the beta versions that they decided, oh, well, we'll release this. So they released it fully well knowing that there were bugs in it and that he wasn't even able to complete the game at that point. Uh, so that was, uh, that was published and released. A few months later, that was maybe half a year later or something like that, uh, when we finally came to an agreement, uh, at that point uh, they did get uh, a corrected version of it and I think it was released, uh, but I don't know how many actually got that, uh, that corrected version. Why wasn't there a Commodore 64 version of Fairlight 2? I, I really don't know. Uh, I wasn't involved in the uh, conversion efforts uh, generally. Uh, I talked a bit to the, the programmers who were doing it, but uh, I wasn't involved uh, as such in, in doing the conversions. And um, I, I could imagine that there was uh, maybe a, some kind of memory constraint problems or something like that on the C64, which uh, made it uh, difficult because uh, with Fairlight 2 we uh, moved over to, uh, to, uh, to dual cassettes, so we had sort of, uh, uh, when you get, got to the end of the f first part, you then loaded in the second tape. Or if you had the uh, the uh, the 128k version, you could actually load it all uh, from from uh, from the start. So I don't know if that messed things up to for doing the Commodore 64 64 version. Could could have been some kind of rights problems to uh, for. Um, who had the rights for selling the uh, Commodore 64 version? Because I think the main main selling place was uh, was in the States uh, for the Commodore 64, and uh, it could have been that there, there was some kind of deal uh, that hindered stuff there. I don't know. At the end of Fairlight 2, there's a screen hinting at a possible third Fairlight game, but this sadly never happened. When I started out doing Fairlight 2, the um, I mean I, I had ideas of turning this into sort of more of a full full blown role playing world sort of and uh, see where we could you could go with it but uh, well that never panned out so have you made any other games um not really we, we did um, I, I was running a, a software business where i was uh, doing contract work for, uh, for doing admi administrative software and uh, i trained up a guy to uh, to use this uh, database uh, package that, that I was using. Uh, and while doing that, uh, sort of as a learning experience, we started to uh, converting a little board game uh, called uh, Rise and Fall. And uh, we actually turned that into a game that we uh, published on the, uh, on the internet. And um, well, we had the, well, I don't know, maybe 20, 30 people, something like that, playing it. Uh, Sort of, it was a turn-based game, so you sort of sent in, sent in, and moved by uh, uh, through a server, and uh, everybody did their move and then sent it on to the next one. Sort of, and it worked quite well. It was, uh, it was a fun game. So this was uh, done in uh, around around uh, 2000 or something like that. Uh, so it was published on the internet. It was never published. Uh, by any publisher, but it was only maybe a couple of hundred downloads or something like that. Uh, it was never that one was intended as a sort of uh, a full-blown blown commercial game or anything like that. This was a, more of a training ex exercise, which turned into a game that was oh, that was fun to play. So we actually did something out of it. 
Have you had many fans contact you over the years? I wouldn't say many, but uh, I mean, there, there is uh, people approach me maybe once a month or something like that, through email or something like that. It varies. It's uh, mostly after, uh, I mean, nothing really before uh, the internet uh, arrived, but uh, from, well, last 15 years maybe, there's, uh, there's been occasional people who sort of drop in and say hello, sort of through the net. It's good, it's good for the ego, I suppose, to have people say, oh, you, you really made my childhood, this sort of, uh, and uh, thank you for making the game and whatever. And uh, it's, it's, it's nice, I suppose. Uh, but I, I, I suppose I, I can imagine those, those, poor, those poor sort of superstars who have sort of hordes of people uh, doing that and uh, driving by your house and uh, doing that. I said, I, I'd never like that. Uh, would never like that kind of uh, kind of attention. So yeah. In various magazines back in the days, there's mentionings of you starting to work on a new set of Spectrum game. Yeah, yeah. I started doing a uh, doing a game. It was based on a um, a technical idea I had, which was to how to get more colors on the screen because the spectrum was limited to having uh, two colors uh, in an 8x8 eight eight pixel uh, area. So color graphics on spectrum was really limited. And uh, I had a little technique which timed the, uh, the interrupt uh, in such a way that I, I switched colors uh, for, every, um, for every line. So basically, you could have a, a one by eight pixel uh, area with you know, different graphics, and so that that gave you a whole different uh, uh, resolution for for the colors. The problem with that technique was that it was using a bit too much the processor power. So by the time I I'd finished the technique and started making a little game around it, I realized that I was not going to have enough processing power to actually do a, uh, a fully working game out of it. So. In the end, I, I cancelled that uh, that project, but it was uh, it was supposed to be called uh, Resolution, I think. In 1988, Ace Magazine mentions you starting working on a 16-bit game. Was that correct? No, not nothing uh, that I uh, I agreed to do for Telecom. So that uh, I was starting to work on the Atari, and I was sort of playing around with it uh, and had ideas for for making a, a game, but. Uh, but nothing that I've uh, approached some company about doing that. They, they probably mixed together the, uh, this, um, this other game that I started out, which was for Te Telecom Soft, with, with me then starting on working on, uh, on an Atari. And, uh, well, that, that didn't pan out. What other 8-bit software were you involved with? Yeah, I did, a, did one a few years later. This was in 8990, I think. Uh, there was this uh, little company in Wales who did a, uh, a follow-up to uh, the Sinclair Spectrum called the uh, Sam Coupe. They basically had the Sinclair Spectrum, uh, an emulation of, of, of the Sinclair Spectrum, uh, and then had a bit more processing power on top of that. So you could play all the old uh, Spectrum games, but you could also do some more fancy stuff with this uh, computer. So to, uh, to be able to show off what you actually could do with a the computer, they, uh, they brought me over to Wales to, uh, to do an art packet for them, uh, which was called uh, Flash. And that came as a sort of standard package together with the, uh, the computer when they started selling that one. So I was there for, uh, what was it, I think about six, uh, six months to, uh, to complete that one. And I, uh, Talk them, help them a bit to sort of uh, how to get get the graphics right on the uh, computer. So uh, I was I was proud proud to to say that I uh, in their more high resolution modes I convinced them to drop uh, having a, a, a flash uh, command because on, on the uh, spectrum you had uh, a flash you could you could uh, they dedicated one one bit uh, of information to sort of have the uh, sh screen pulse in one of these 8x8 eight eight, uh, uh, pixels. But in the in the more advanced mode on this Sam Coupe, I told them that, no, scrap that. That one extra bit is really, really valuable for doubling the amount of colors you can have. 
which is a lot more worth uh, worthwhile. You can make a lot, lot better and, and prettier pictures uh, with that. So, for instance, uh, the grayscale, for instance, uh, doubling the amount of grayscale you can have in the, in the picture is, makes a huge difference. Do you miss game development, and is there any chance of you coming back to it? Uh, I've been thinking about it. I started doing some stuff, but uh, it's it's too much to work today uh, to make something that I would feel proud about uh, releasing, I think. So, uh, uh, I don't think, as it looks today, I'm not, I'm not coming back into game development. It's a, it's a really, really tough business to get into these days. Uh, I suppose you could do something small and release it on your own, but uh, I don't know. I don't know what kind of game that would be anyway. It probably wouldn't be Fairlight, it wouldn't be if I do gaming, yeah, I game a lot. <laughs> I, I was born a gamer, I think. I, I play a lot on, uh, on the PC. Uh, different uh, online games and uh, strategic games. And Civilization, for instance, that's uh, one of my long-time favorite. That's, that's probably the game I've spent most, most hours on. If, I'm not going to pull up uh, my Steam account to show how many hours I spent on it, but it's quite a few. <laughs> I generally don't play that much of uh, these kind of um, uh, third-person shooters or things like that. I did play Doom a bit when it came out in the 90s, that was amazing, but uh, uh, lately not much. I, I try out some games and so on, but it's... Uh, it's a bit of fun, but, but the, the games I spend time on is probably strategic games and, uh, and uh, it's role-playing games. Dark Souls? No, I haven't actually. I'm, uh, that's probably too hard for me, I think. <laughs> at, least, uh, at least from what I've heard. It's, uh, it, it takes a, a large amount, amount of dexterity and being very, very fast. It's more fun actually playing games than making them. <laughs> It's a lot, a lot of work to, 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 uh, to do a proper game. That's uh, something that uh, everybody should realize if they, if they get into it. It's, yeah, it's, it's big business these days. So it's, um, that's, that's probably one of the reasons why I'm not feeling that confident, comfortable in getting back into uh, to the gaming business because uh, uh, to be able to make these games, you have to compartmentalize uh, everything that's being done so one person is doing this tiny little bit and I want to have sort of the the, the greater view uh, of doing things and if I were to do that that wouldn't mean that I would have to be a manager then, then I wouldn't get to code anything and ah, oh, what's the fun in that and with that we have reached the end thank you very much for doing this interview do you have any finishing words oh live long and prosper <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's a fun interview. So, thank you. As a, fr a friend of mine who who, um, who approached me uh, a couple of years, so he sort of um, because we were, I think we were talking about copyright stuff and whatever sort of, and he, he sort of fessed up and said said, uh, "Well, I never actually bought Fairlight. <laughs> I didn't play it." Sort of. So so he he said, "Oh well, okay, I'll, I'll owe you lunch <laughs> at some point." So, <laughs> so he actually paid up, uh, but uh, sort of twenty five years later. <laughs>